Yes. Okay. Right. Now uh, let us move on to uh, another tachycardia, which is uh, supraventricular tachycardia. To be more accurate, we should be calling this paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. Uh, the ECG uh, of uh, PSVT is grossly different from uh, that of ventricular tachycardia, but uh, now uh, as students or as interns, you might initially find it difficult to differentiate. So first of all, let us see what we mean by supraventricular tachycardia, uh, or it is also called as narrow complex tachycardia. See, when we use the word supraventricular tachycardia, we essentially mean that the driving focus of the tachycardia is above the level of the AV node. It is uh, not in the ventricles, it is not uh, at the AV node, it is above the level of the AV node. So that's what we call a supraventricular tachycardia. And last class I told you, now when such tachycardias are generated due to abnormal, uh, uh, let us say, re-entry phenomena or something like that in the atrium or thereabouts, these impulses are going to reach the ventricles through the normal AV node, his bundle, bundle branches, Purkinje fibers. And whenever an impulse activates or depolarizes the ventricles via that route, I said earlier that uh, the QRS complex is going to be, uh, the QRS complex is going to be narrow. So that is why we call this, uh, that's why we call this tachycardia as narrow complex tachycardia. Okay. Last class itself, we discussed the reason why the QRS, normal QRS is narrow and the conditions where it is broad. Okay. So uh, therefore it stands to reason that any tachycardia which arises above the level of the AV node would be conducted into the ventricles through the AV node, his bundle, bundle branches, Purkinje fibers pathway, which is the normal conducting pathway. And hence the QRS duration is going to be uh, in the normal uh, 0.08 uh, seconds. So we studied that too last class, the normal QRS duration is 0.04 to 0.08. Therefore, we usually tend to equate supraventricular tachycardias uh, with, uh, with narrow complex tachycardias. By narrow complex, we obviously mean narrow QRS complex. So even simple things like sinus tachycardia and the arrhythmias which we, uh, which we discussed last class, like atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, multifocal atrial tachycardia, all of them arise in the atrium. Uh, and consequently, the QRS, QRS complexes are going to be narrow because the downstream conduction is through the AV node his bundle. Now, a group of narrow complex tachycardias we label as paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. So this is uh, a distinction which you need to know. Uh, uh, in common parlance, when people use the word SVT, uh, they are usually talking about this. But the accurate term for this should be paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. So there is a group of tachycardias called as paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardias, uh, which contain uh, these uh, the major ones, major types of so-called PSVT. Uh, the first one is AVNRT or AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. More than 60 percentage of paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardias uh, arise due to re-entrant phenomenon, re-entry phenomenon uh, at or around the AV node. That is called as AV nodal re-entrant tachycardia. So they form the majority of PSVT. So most common cause of PSVT is an AV nodal re-entrant tachycardia. Then we have other types, for example, AV re-entrant tachycardia or atrioventricular re-entrant tachycardia, where there is a huge or macro re-entrant circuit between the atrium and the ventricles due to the, uh, the presence of an abnormal pathway. Very commonly we encounter that in WPW syndrome. Okay. So the, the we will be discussing WPW in some detail later on. So that is uh, AV or atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia. Then we have other tachycardia called as paroxysmal atrial tachycardia, junctional tachycardia, etc. So all of these share a common feature uh, and the common feature is that they are narrow complex and they have some ECG features. The ECG of uh, SVT or to be more accurate PSVT, uh, it looks like this. As you can see uh, very clearly, the rate is very fast. That's the first thing which comes to uh, our, uh, our attention here. Uh, the rate is uh, literally, uh, let's say 300 thereabouts, okay? And uh, you can see that all the QRS complexes are narrow. There are no P waves to be seen. And 
it one complex looks exactly like another complex. So there is no difference between the morphology of the individual QRS complexes, and we call this an, an, a monotonously regular complexes. It is like uh, each each QRS complex is a photostat of the one before it and one after it. So an entirely monotonous picture, a fast rate, a narrow complex, absence of P waves will give us the picture of a PS. Or paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. This type of tachycardia, um, uh, for example, most common we said is AV nodal renal tachycardia. It is very common uh, in females, usually in young females. It presents as uh, palpitations, which is obviously an uncomfortable awareness of your own heart rate or heart beating. So palpitation. Very, very rarely does it produce symptoms severe enough or very rarely does it go to be severe enough to produce hypotension and uh, circulatory collapse or something like that. Most often it presents with palpitation. Uh, so this is another picture. You can see the characteristic tachycardia. As I said, uh, I told you in the last class itself, we have an algorithm when we cannot appreciate proper P wave. So here in this ECG, if you look, there is no proper P wave to be seen. And then once the P wave is absent, uh, the next thing to do, obviously, is to check whether the QRS complex is narrow or broad. And after that, the thing to check, obviously, is the RR interval regular or RR interval is irregular. If uh, there is no P wave and the QRS complexes are narrow, and if the RR interval were irregular, we would have most probably called this uh, as atrial fibrillation. But here, because the RR intervals are very regular, Obviously, uh, it is most likely to be uh, an SVT or PSVT to be more accurate. So this is the this is just the most common type of uh, PSVT, which is AV and RT. Just trying to you know show you what happens uh, what happens in these situations. So on the left side, extreme left side, uh, that is uh, this panel shows you basically normal conduction. Uh, so. Uh, as you know, the essence, the essential thing for a reentrant phenomenon to occur are two things. For any reentry, there are two essential things to be satisfied. First of, first of all, there should be two pathways. There should be one, uh, two pathways is conducted different speeds. So one should be conducting faster than the other. So fast pathway, slow pathway. The second condition is that you should have a prematurely timed beat or a premature contraction a premature atrial complex, as it is mentioned, as it is usually described. So there should be a premature beat. Because if it is a normal beat, nothing will happen even if you have two conducting pathways. That is what is exemplified in the, in the first picture there. So we have the fast pathway and the slow pathway. Uh, this is the atrium, this is the ventricles. This, let us imagine, is around the uh, uh, AV node here. And uh, the fast uh, impulse comes down the fast pathway, fast pathway like this. Impulse also comes down the slow pathway, but it is naturally slower. So this is junction one, this is junction two. And when the impulse reaches junction two, uh, the impulse just goes downstream and the ventricle is activated. Now uh, this, uh, at, at the junction there's obviously, there, is, uh, there are two pathways there. Now this impulse can go back up, but then it cannot proceed too much because the slow pathway is being activated from this impulse coming down. Therefore, it is refractory to this impulse going back. And therefore, this impulse is killed here. Uh, and the slow pathway impulse which comes downstream is also killed here when these two meet. And therefore, there is no problem on that side. And the conduction exclusively occurs via the fast pathway. Therefore, even if we have a slow pathway and a fast pathway, it does not really matter on a normal person. Now, let us imagine the situation of a uh, so-called premature beat. Am I audible to you? I hope I'm audible. Can, some, can someone un unmute and tell me whether I'm audible to you? Are you following the discussion? Yes or no? OK. Um, you just unmute uh, and tell me whether it is uh, I'm audible or not, okay? Because I will not be looking at the chat box uh, because the screen is in front of me. Anyway, so um, yeah, so let us talk about the second, uh, the middle panel, what is happening here. So here we have two pathways uh, and we have so-called a premature complex, a premature impulse, which is coming downstream from the atrium to the ventricles. Now, uh, a couple of things to remember regarding the fast and slow pathway. Uh, 
the first thing is fast pathways recover slowly this is something which you have to remember fast pathways recover slowly slow pathways recover quickly this is an important rule to remember fast pathways fast pathways recover slowly slow pathways recover quickly so let us just imagine this situation so let us imagine the first situation has happened one normal impulse has come down and now this is a premature impulse a premature atrial contraction or depolarization the impulse comes down so what did i tell you about fast pathway fast pathway recovers slowly fast pathway recovers slowly that, which means that this is a fast pathway it has not recovered completely it is still refractory therefore the impulse cannot be conducted the, the premature impulse cannot be conducted through the fast pathway because it has not yet recovered now if this was a if this was not a premature impulse it was a normally timed impulse this would not have been a problem because by the time the normally timed impulse would reach the junction 1 uh, the fast pathway would have recovered completely but the problem is this is not a normal beat but it is actually a premature beat which is coming down and uh, when the premature beat comes down it finds that the fast pathway has not yet recovered because fast pathways recover slowly as i said so then the impulse has uh, only one path to go down and that is obviously the slow pathway and i told you slow pathways recover quickly slow pathways recover quickly therefore this pathway has recovered and now the impulse can come down okay come down the slow pathway when it comes down the slow pathway and reaches that particular point by that time the fast pathway would recover and now this sets up the reentrant phenomenon because now our impulse have two routes it can take it can go down like that obviously and can go back and because this pathway has recovered now so it is we call that as slow fast rhythm the it downstream or the anterograde contraction conduction is through the slow pathway and the retrograde conduction is through the fast pathway so and a reentrant phenomenon is set up so this is called as a slow fast uh, avnrt uh, or um, uh, all these things are uh, technically you actually need not know about this thing at your level anyway so we call this slow fast this is one of the commonest types we said avnrt is the most common type of uh, paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia and most of those cases are due to a slow fast mechanism whereby uh, the uh, premature atrial beat comes down the junction and uh, goes downstream anterograde conduction is via the slow pathway and the retrograde conduction uh, is via the fast pathway this sets up a reentrant circuit and the impulses depolarize both the atrium and the ventricles roughly almost simultaneously and consequently there is an increased heart rate uh, the p wave if it occurs uh, is usually buried within the qrs complex or sometimes it can occur slightly after just after the qrs complex Uh, it is very rare to see a p wave just before the qrs complex uh, in a slow fast pathway so that is what usually uh, occurs i will discuss the p waves in svt uh, psvt in a minute so that is one of the major types of reentrant phenomenon obviously uh, we will be discussing uh, more about this uh, in our uh, theory class on arrhythmias right so this is uh, another feature of av nrt av nodal reentrant tachycardia especially the slow fast type and you can see here uh, after the qrs complex in v1 there is an, another small wave there another small positive wave uh, occasionally you can see that is called as a pseudo r wave that is called as pseudo r wave it is not an r wave it is actually the p wave occurring slightly after the qrs complex pseudo r wave so pseudo r wave is usually seen characteristically in v1 and it is associated with uh, av nodal reentrant tachycardia and it is usually a positive wave uh, just after the qrs complex so pseudo r wave is is typical of an av nrt type of paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia i hope uh, that is clear to you yes or no so what is the general ecg pattern of uh, psvt or svt so absence of p waves narrow qrs complexes and uh, tachycardia obviously a very fast ventricular rate and all complexes which look uh, similar to each other uh, is monotonous monotonously regular complexes okay uh, can you look very uh, closely at this ecg and tell me what uh, is the abnormality there i can zoom it if you want 
you can just unmute and tell me yes delta waves yeah so here you can see very very good so here first of all obviously you should start off by looking at the p wave and the prn devil and we notice that the prn devil is extremely small and not only that there is a slurring on the upstroke of the r wave uh, if you look very closely here that is that is a slurring so the upstroke of the r wave there is a slurring and that slurring is called as the delta wave and this is characteristic of uh, ventricular pre excitation syndrome ventricular pre excitation syndrome which is what we used to we used to be called previously as wpw or wolf parkinson white right? nowadays that name is not that preferred just pre excitation syndrome would do here is a closer look at the delta wave you can see that initial yeah that uh, that initial slurring uh, of the r wave so obviously the next question is how does this happen and it is not mandatory that all uh, all wpw syndrome patients should have the same thing so let us first of all uh, yeah uh, we will discuss that and get back so we know that wpw is a it is a condition involving abnormal conducting uh, pathways between the atrium and ventricles we said that usually uh, the atrium and ventricles have only one electrical communicating channel between them that is obviously the av node uh, but in this patient due to some congenital abnormalities or perhaps following surgery but that is very unusual usually due to congenital abnormalities there is a communication there is a band of tissue or a strip of tissue uh, which uh, which acts as a conduit for um, electrical impulses from the atrium into the ventricles therefore um, Uh, the the there are two ways for any atrial impulse to reach the ventricles one is through the normal av node his bundle pathway and other is through the uh, aberrant bundle so that situation is called as wpw syndrome we will examine the uh, ecg changes in slightly more detail so the commonest things commonest ecg findings or the most typical ecg findings you expect are number one first short prn devil the prn devil is short because as said uh, if the uh, impulse if the atrial impulse reaches the ventricles via the aberrant pathway instead of via the av node obviously there is no delay associated with av nodal crossing and consequently the prn devil which is a measure of this delay at the av node and this prn devil is very short so a short prn devil a wide qrs we will discuss why the qrs is wide and whether it is always wide and then we will discuss uh, the third feature which is the delta wave okay so just uh, let us have a look at that so all of you might be familiar with uh, at least one of these aberrant bundles the most famous of these aberrant bundles is called as the bundle of kent and lies in the uh, left lateral wall i am just going to draw the uh, uh, representative picture for you okay so let us imagine that this is our bundle of kent a strip of tissue and as i told you because this is obviously when it's a strip of tissue is many muscle or other uh, uh, other tissue which lies which acts as a bridge between the atrium and ventricles uh, naturally we know that this is not a functional problem of the heart but rather a structural problem it is not due to any electrolyte or any channel abnormality which which is actually a problem but there is actually a structural problem and because it's a structural problem it is associated with other structural heart disorders um one of the one of the common situations which we have already studied about during our uh, cardiovascular system class the early part is w is, is uh, its association with cases of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as you know is also a structural uh, heart disease and at that time itself we talked about several syndromes several genetic syndromes like for example um, lacking storage disorder type 2b uh, or uh, 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 the AMPK2 mutation, where we have an association of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with WPW syndrome, is it not so? Uh, so students who were there in those in those uh, classes would have perhaps heard about that. 
Right. So this is uh, uh, this. Let us imagine that this is the aberrant bundle, bundle of Kent, which communicates between the atom and ventricles. So let us draw the normal conducting system. The normal SA node is over there. The normal AV node is over here, and then we have the case bundle and the bundle branches like that. Okay. So I'm just drawing a very crude diagram. Here. Okay. Right. Now, so this obviously from the SA node, uh, it uh, the there are fibers which activate the right atrium and also the uh, left atrium. We call it the Backman model, etc. earlier. So there is left atrial activation. And let us imagine that now this impulse has two ways of entering the ventricles. Obviously, one way in which it can enter is via the normal pathway, but there is a delay there. But it can also enter the ventricles like this. There is no delay there. There is no delay. And therefore, first of all, what is the QR, uh, QRS, uh, uh, or what is the EC issue? EC shows a very normal QRS complex. Now, the vent because the ventricle has started depolarizing uh, immediately after the atrial depolarization because the impulse has been conducted. Now, let us imagine that this aberrant bundle uh, is terminating in muscular tissue of the left ventricular free wall. We know that this is not connected to the normal cardiac conducting system. So the muscles here, the muscle fibers here are going to be activated. They are going to start depolarizing and then the next muscle fiber, the next muscle fiber like that. They are going to get activated. This is not via the normal conducting system. And as I told you previously, when the ventricular myocardium is not conducted via the normal conducting system, but by the impulse jumping from muscle fiber to muscle fiber, it takes a long time. We talked about the, uh, the, the, the effect of the microtubules, etc. Uh, or the transfer is the, the 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 transverse tubule etc in retarding the speed of conduction we said the Perkin G fibers didn't have them that is why they conduct very quickly etc anyway so when the myocardial fibers are depolarized they jump the impulse jumps from fiber to fiber to fiber and naturally the initial part of the QRS is slow so uh, the initial part of the QRS is like this it is slow because it is it looks like it is going to take some time for the ventricle to get depolarized no, but what happens when, the, when, by the time this has captured so much of the ventricle, what happens is now this impulse, the normal atrial impulse, which is now crossing, there was a delay at the AV node, this, but this impulse has now crossed. Now the conduction is very fast. Therefore, the remaining of the ventricle is depolarized by the normal impulse, which comes down from the AV node. And that is a narrow complex. So this is because the Perkin G fibers are extremely fast. So the early part, of the ventricular depolarization, which was due to the impulse crossing over from the atrium via the aberrant pathway and directly activating the ventricular myocardium from fiber to fiber to fiber. There, the, that for that part, the QRS is slightly slurred or slightly delayed. That is why it appears to be a bit broadish. It is taking some time. But then after some time, when the normal impulse comes downstream, the ventricular is depolarized via the normal conducting system. Uh, AV node, his bundle, bundle branches like that. And therefore, the rest of the QRS is narrow. So the initial portion of this QRS is therefore, there is a slight delay, and this is called as the delta wave. So this is the genesis of the delta wave. I hope all of you have understood. Yes or no? You can unmute and tell me. Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. So that is how the delta wave is generated. Now let us see whether uh, always you need to have a delta wave or not. Okay. Uh, it is not always mandatory that you have uh, a delta wave or this looks, the ECG looks exactly like what we have just now drawn. Okay, right. Okay, now imagine a situation where this aberrant pathway is not here, but rather let us imagine the aberrant pathway is here. Let us say that it is like this. It is a communication between the conducting system, which is bypassing the AV node totally. Uh, the such pathways are called as atriohesian pathways. Atriohesian. They directly connect from the atrium to the his bundle bypassing the AV node. Atriohesian. Okay, imagine that. So what happens here? So the impulse comes down like that. 
impulse comes down and then obviously it takes the both pathways the normal as well as abnormal and the advantage of the abnormal pathway is it is a shortcut uh, it can directly enter the his bundle without passing through the av node so consequently obviously there is going to be p wave the pr and double is going to be extremely short what about the qrs complex the ventricle is activated via the normal conducting system and therefore the qrs complex is a normal narrow qrs complex there is no delta wave or anything because there is no pre excite there is pre excitation but the pre excitation is not going to produce a widening of the qrs complex because uh, in actual fact there is the the fact why we call it pre excitation is simply because it is bypassing the av node otherwise it is not widening the qrs or anything because it is terminating in a his perkinji system itself i hope you understood that so this person is going to have uh as his only ecg feature he is going to have only a narrow pr level i hope you understood this yes or no yes sir yes so uh, so you need not always have the delta wave etc the and qrs always always need not be wide the qrs is he said the qrs is usually wide uh, because there is an initial uh, slurring and then the qrs goes like that and therefore that contributes to the width of the qrs complex but uh, in this case the qrs is narrow so it so in svt psvt uh, sorry in wpw syndrome you can get all these uh, findings so the delta wave is not an absolute requirement uh, in a patient uh, in an, in the ecg of a wpw syndrome patient and even the p wave sometimes might not be seen and the one more picture i would uh, like to draw is imagine that okay so we have the normal conducting system there every node suppose we have a conducting uh, pathway here but uh, it is just a one way traffic Uh, it is it is not going to con uh, conduct in the anterograde manner it is going to conduct only opposite direction the retrograde manner which means it is going to conduct in this direction okay this direction so what happens there is a big reentrant circuit like that the impulse normally comes down in this way it comes down like this via the normal conducting system which means that you are going to have a normal p wave and a normal qrs complex because ventricles are activated via the normal conducting system so you get a normal qrs complex and because then this climbs up and there's a reentrant circuit so it keeps on going like that here uh, you can see that the uh, only thing which is perhaps present is a tachycardia and obviously this is a reentry this is what we call as called earlier as av or atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia so perhaps there is a there is a tachycardia here and it is a narrow complex tachycardia as you can see very clearly and sometimes the there is no delta wave or anything like that okay so that is that's why i said you can have you no know, different patterns of ecg changes in uh, in uh, wpw syndrome depending upon where the abnormal conduction takes place or from which direction or in which direction the abnormal conduction takes place i hope this is clear to you yes or no yes sir yes so let us move forward again so delta wave we have there delta wave slurring there race yes. uh, so initial portion of the qrs being slurred that is a delta wave also note the very short pr and double the qrs taking off immediately after the p wave has ended now as i said uh, here uh, there are two types of tachycardia you can get uh, in somebody with wpw syndrome uh, in the first instance uh, look at uh, these they are called as orthodromic or anterograde So orthodromic conduction, narrow tachycardia, and antidromic or wide tachycardia. Let us see what what we mean by all these things. Okay, so in the first situation, you can see that the impulse comes like this, crosses the AV node, as I drew just now, then goes into the ventricles, and then it this pathway conducts backwards. Uh, the, there is a reentrant tachycardia like that in that direction. So in this pit. picture it would be anti clockwise so in this that okay there is a reentrant circuit like that and the ecg is like this as we said it is a narrow complex tachycardia because the ventricles are activated through the normal his perkinji system look at the opposite side where we have a pathway which conducts like this downstream axillary pathway so there is so called pre excitation and even before the when the impulse has, normal impulse will come down the impulse goes back up via the av node activating the atria so here it is in this diagram the reentrant pathway is clockwise so it is like this 
So downward conduction into the ventricles is via the accessory pathway. Up from the ventricle into the atrium is via the AV node. Okay. Now here, because the ventricle is activated through the aberrant pathway and not by the normal conducting system, the QRS complex is broad. You can see every single QRS complex is broad. What does this look like? What is this ECG pattern? We already see this ECG pattern previously. A broad complex, evenly uh, uh, distributed complexes, all complexes looking this uh, same. Broad complex tachycardia, no P waves. What is this SVT. pattern? Ah, come on. Broad complex. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. No, why you? How? Why do you say keep on saying PSVT in in e narrow complex like in broad complex like This is a broad complex, is not so. We said earlier e that this is no. uh, the axillary pathway is conducting downstream from the atrium to the ventricles. The ventricle is being activated via the accessory pathway, not the normal conducting system. Therefore, it is taking time, and the QRS complex is broad. And then the impulse goes back up into the atrium through the AV node. Okay, so. Then we have this AV reentrant tachycardia, and all the QRS complexes are broad. And somebody said in between the correct answer. What is the correct answer? Once again, tell me. Ventricular tachycardia. Ah, it looks like a ventricular tachycardia. And what specifically? What type of ventricular tachycardia? Monomorphic. 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 Very good. Very good. Very. Good. So it's such a WP uh, such situations uh, of WPW syndrome. Uh, it might not be uh, very easy to diagnose what is happening from the ECG because the, the ECG looks like as if the patient is having a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. Uh, the management is different. We'll discuss the management, the difference in management when we talk about the theory part of this. But at least you understood the ECG differences between these two types. Same thing, WPW syndrome is accessory pathway, but in which direction it conducts, etc., has a huge influence on what is the uh, ECG pattern. I hope you understood that. Yes or no? Yes, sir. Yes, right. So that is as far as uh, our discussion of supraventricular tachycardia is concerned. What does this ECG show? This is, we were, you remember what we were discussing? I said we are going to go in an orderly fashion when we look at the ECG. First, we, are talk, we talked about the P wave, uh, after talking about the sinus rhythm, the axis, and all those things, P wave, PR, and level, we are talking about the QRS complex, right? That is where we discuss, first of all, bundle box hypertrophies and ventricular tachycardia because of the broad complexes. And we are discussed now the uh, SVTs and WPW, right? Now, what does this show? Look carefully at the, forget about the P wave and things like that. Just look at the QRS complexes and tell me. If you very look very carefully, you'll notice that the P wave and PIN double is normal. Now look at the QRS complexes and tell me what is happening here. Different voltages. Hmm. Different voltages or look more carefully. Alternating voltages, is it not so? Alternate, alternate QRS complexes are big, alternate ones are small, is it not so? Alternate ones have big voltage, alternate ones have small voltage. This is called as, it's a very famous ECG. What is it called as? It happens in situations where uh, you have fluid in the pericardial sac and the heart swings uh, and uh, Towards and away from the particular region. Yes. Effusion. What is the EC finding referred to as? No, no. What is the EC finding called as? Electrical alternates. Very good. Electrical alternates. Electrical alternates. Right. So this is a classic. You don't need to have tamponade always. If you just have a large pericardial effusion, not all large effusions cause tamponade. They usually do, but it depends upon how quickly the fluid accumulates. We'll again we'll study that in a theory class. So uh, this is electrical alternance where there is an alternating high uh, alternating voltage of the QRS. So this is uh, to be very specific. You should be calling this QRS alternance. Okay, QRS alternance because there are things like T wave alternance where the T wave can be inverted upright, uh, inverted upright alternately. That also can happen. T wave alternance, but it is not very common. You should be seen in stress testing, etc. Like, for example, a dobutamine stress test or in a treadmill test. If you find T wave alternance, it indicates that the patient has a risk for uh, ventricular tachycardia. Um, we'll, we'll discuss why that is important later on. So, anyway, here we would be specifically be calling it as a QRS alternance. QRS alternance. Uh, and QRS alternance is characteristic of pericardial effusion, especially large effusions. 
So that ends our discussion of the QRS complex. So we are nearing the end of our discussion of the ECG. Now let us discuss the remainder, that is abnormalities and repolarization. Now we studied earlier that QRS was basically which part of the ECG it was, uh, it was the depolarization part of the ventricles, yes? Depolarization of the ventricles. Now we are going to talk about abnormalities in repolarization of the ventricles, that is ST segment and T wave. If you look at this action potential, and you try to correlate that with the ECG. This obviously is a phase zero, the upstroke or phase zero. This because of the sodium entry. This obviously is the QRS complex. And then we have the repolarization. So a repolarization, we have early repolarization, which is labeled as one here, plateau two here, and late repolarization, which is labeled as three here, obviously because of the uh, potassium channels, the outward movement of potassium. Uh, we have the uh, rapidly rectifying channel, we have the slow potassium channel, and we have the transient outward potassium, which is uh, channel uh, or transient outward current, which is responsible for the early repolarization. Anyway, so uh, so as so naturally, this portion from here to here, this is what. This portion is uh, is what is represented by the ST segment and the T wave. Late repolarization, the phase three of the repolarization is represented by the T wave uh, in the ECG. The plateau phase uh, represents the uh, ST segment. And then when you look at early repolarization, uh, this is uh, you know gray area here. What is, because it's a very tiny pe period of time. What is the, which is the ECG, uh, 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 analog uh, or the corresponding point of early repolarization and we refer to this usually it is now referred to as the J point uh, which is at the junction of the QRS complex with the ST segment the J point okay so uh, so we say the J point uh, or thereabouts represent early repolarization part uh, of the ventricular repolarization the plateau phase second phase corresponds to ST segment late repolarization corresponds to the T wave. Now let us start off by discussing that J point. As I told you earlier, the J point is the junction in a normal ECG. You can see the J point is the junction uh, of the QRS complex with the ST segment. So here we have a J point elevation. J point is elevated from the ST, uh, from uh, the baseline. Okay. So here also J point is elevated from the baseline. And if you get a small sec uh, in a, a, a wave at the J point, it is referred to as the J wave. There are different causes for a J wave or the so-called early repolarization wave, early repolarization wave. So a small positive wave there uh, at the junction of the Q uh, R wave with the ST segment, we call it, the point is called as J point. If you get a positive wave there, it is referred to as J wave. Uh, it is interesting uh, what the reasons for a J wave are. Let us have a look at some uh, common abnormalities which can occur at the J point. First is called as benign early repolarization. A benign early repolarization uh, is just a small uh, elevation uh, at the J point, elevation of the J point. It is usually seen mostly in the lateral leads, V3, V4, V5, V6. So a small elevation in the pre it's not usually seen in the limb leads, it's usually seen in the lateral precordial leads in young, healthy patients. So that is called as benign early repolarization, where you, might, you can have a tiny, almost uh, sort of, you know, virtually invisible, small positive wave there at the end, at the beginning of the ST segment. That is called as benign early repolarization. Uh, here also, if you look very carefully, you can see at the beginning here, uh, of V5 and all here you can see, okay, uh, you can see a small wave. So that is called as benign early repolarization. Sometimes the J point itself might be lifted uh, above the baseline. So here you can see that a bit more clearly situation is like that, right? The bottom most strip you can see. So this is benign early repolarization is usually uh, seen in young, thin, healthy individuals in the pre chest leads, in the lateral precordial leads. And uh, so this, uh, the problem of with the early repolarization uh, is that, you know, sometimes it can be mistaken for uh, the ST elevation, uh, 
in myocardial infarction. But that should not be so because the ST elevation of myocardial inf uh, infarction uh, is a convex ST elevation. Usually it is a convex elevation where this is, as you can see, concave. The concavity is upwards. So it is concave. And uh, to highlight the concavity, uh, often people rig up various signs, uh, smiley appearance, we call this, called as a smiley appearance. Whereas if the ST segment were concave, like that, uh, and then your smiley would not be a smiley, it would be a frown. Okay, so it would be called because this looks like this. So it's called as a frowny. So if, uh, if, the, if the ST segment is frowny, it looks like this patient is frowning. This this image is frowning. It is actually an MI, whereas if it is smiling, it is actually benign early repolarization. So these are some generalizations you can make, but you know uh, we should not rely too much on such ECG findings to check whether the patient is having a myocardial infarction or not. As I told you, the other piece of a diagnosis of myocardial infarction is obviously positive troponins. Uh, and some people also refer to as a fish hook appearance because uh, a part of this looks like a fish hook, uh, this much portion, uh, almost, uh, let's see. Uh, so this looks like a fish hook, that portion, right? This. So it looks like a fish hook. So fish hook appearance, uh, it is sometimes referred to as. So that is the pattern of uh, uh, early uh, repolarization, benign early repolarization. Now, the as I said, it is not very likely that you are going to confuse it with ST elevation of MI. The closest differential diagnosis as far as ECG appearance is concerned is usually acute pericarditis because pericarditis is characterized by ST elevations which are concave upwards. So that uh, appears to be a closer differential diagnosis than a myocardial infarction. So care should be uh, what what are the EC findings of pericarditis we'll be discussing downstream. Uh, okay, so care should be used to differentiate uh, uh, this pattern from myocardial infarction and pericarditis. Okay, uh, so this is another situation where the J wave uh, is significantly, uh, or there's a there's a, a second positive wave there at the J point. Therefore, we have to label it as a J wave. As I said, there are multiple causes for the uh, positivity at that particular point. And one of the most common ones is uh, an Osborne wave. Osborne wave. Osborne wave is seen in, is seen in hypothermia. Osborne wave is seen in hypothermia. Okay, so there are multiple. The Osborne wave is, uh, is not the only cause of a positive wave uh, there. We already saw the benign uh, early repolarization pattern. So Osborne wave is another. Uh, another situation where you can get this hypercalcemia, hypercalcemia, hypercalcemia. Uh, another situation uh, where we can see this is uh, in a syndrome called as Brugada syndrome. Is, uh, we will be discussing that also later on. Brugada syndrome is a channelopathy. It's a channelopathy, uh, particular, of, a particular subset of sodium channels which are present on the right ventricular outflow tract, which can actually, so there's a genetic, there's a mutation and it can actually progress, uh, produce abnormal conduction problems there in the right ventricular outflow tract and can also serve as a substrate for ventricular tachycardia and sudden cardiac death. So there is Brugada syndrome. We'll see that later. So these are some of the differentials for uh, that J point or J wave syndromes, as we call it. One is we said the Osborne wave. Uh, the other is uh, Brugada. Uh, the other is uh, uh, how to identify Brugada syndrome from ECG. We will see later on. The other is hyper. Um, calcemia and uh, obviously the last one we talked about benign early repolarization. So how to, how to differentiate Osborne wave from hyperkalemia, not hyperkalemia, sorry, hypercalcemia. How to differentiate this from hypercalcemia uh, is uh, one of the easiest ways in which to uh, identify is to look at the QT interval. QT interval also we are going to discuss uh, in a minute. So if you look at the QT interval, which is from the beginning of the QRS complex to the end of the T wave. The QT interval is prolonged in hypothermia, whereas it is shortened in hypercalcemia. Only hypocalcemia prolongs the QT interval. Hypercalcemia shortens the QT interval. Anyway, so that is one way in which we can differentiate whether this is actually Osborne wave is actually, uh, so you know, the, the, the J wave is actually an Osborne wave or not. Anyway, so I said this, such J wave abnormalities are usually seen in the right precordial, sorry, left precordial leads, left lateral leads, precordial V4, V5, and V6. Those are the leads where we appreciate it the most. Again, a typical Osborne wave. Am I audible to you? Did you understand what I was discussing up to this point? Yes or no? Yes, sir. 
Right. So uh, V5 again, uh, another uh, look at the Osborne wave there. Another wave uh, you can, another, uh, and uh, another wave you can see, and one of the characteristics of this, you know, Osborne wave and uh, this um, uh, hypercalcemia, uh, the, the J wave there, uh, is that that Osborne wave is the, usually the same direction of the dominant QRS diffraction. If the dominant QRS diffraction is upward, as in this case, it is a positive deflection, huge positive deflection. Therefore, this is also positive. If the dominant QRS deflection was downward, then this wave also would have been downward. So usually there is a sort of concordance between this, the direction of this wave and the direction of the R wave. Okay. So yeah, so let us move forward. Now, this is another wave uh, which occurs uh, not exactly at the J point, but slightly after that, it is called uh, the epsilon wave. It is called as the epsilon wave. The epsilon wave uh, is associated with a condition called as ARVDC or arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy or dysplasia. Arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy bar dysplasia, ARVCD as it is called. We already saw this disease when we are discussing cardiomyopathy. So epsilon wave is associated with ARVCD, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy dysplasia. This again is characteristically seen in V1. V1. So these were some of the abnormalities in the early repolarization phase we discussed. So just to recapitulate the so-called benign early repolarization pattern, then we talked about the Osborne wave uh, then we talked about uh, you know the wave which we can get in hypercalcemia, Brugada syndrome, and the epsilon wave in ARV uh, DC. Okay. So next, uh, let us go to the mid portion of the plateau phase of the repolarization part. This, which is obviously the ST segment, ST segment in ischemic heart disease. So uh, there are uh, there are different patterns. Of the ST segment, as you can see, uh, the classical uh, ischemic ST segment is a convex ST elevation upwards like that. Convex ST elevation, which produces. A, if I were to draw a face and put, uh, uh, okay, it would be frowny. That's why we said it. We called it as frowny. Whereas uh, the uh, benign early repolarization would be a smiley face. Okay. Now, uh, we will not discuss too much about the, the genesis of the ST segment. It is due to a process called as current of injury. You don't need to know too much about that. Uh, and uh, it is perhaps, uh, you know, you can, you can go and read it up if you want those of uh, who, who uh, are interested in that. And or else uh, you can um, contact me uh, later. Uh, I can discuss it over the phone or something. Uh, okay, because it is going to consume some time. Uh, anyway, uh, that is not germane to our uh, discussion right now. So ST elevation we know is characteristic. Uh, we said that usually we get ST elevations when we have you know transmural ischemia. We discussed that also when we talked about ischemic heart disease, and it is uh, one of the classical uh, classical uh, ECG findings suggestive of myocardial ischemia and infarction. So. Uh, this uh, in front of you would be an anterior wall, anteroseptal, because V1, V2, V3, V4, we look at the septal wall, anteroseptal wall, therefore anteroseptal. And in this case, we have ST elevation 2, 3, and AVF. Look at the uh, typical ST elevation there. All of those ST elevations are uh, convex. Uh, upwards, uh, convex, they are convex. Now, uh, and look at the so-called reciprocal ST depression. If, so we are having, we are talking about inferior wall MI in this particular ECG. So two, three AVF, there's significant ST segment elevation. Where here we have uh, uh, ST segment depression in one AVL, uh, and which are the lateral leads. So that is usually referred to as a reciprocal change. Reciprocal. If you have a ST elevation in the inferior wall, you can you can have ST depression in the antro in the lateral wall. Especially if we have an antro lateral MI, we have ST depression in the inferior wall. So that is called as reciprocal ST depression. In this case, we can see uh, some additional uh, leads being placed on the right side. V4 R, V5 R, V6 R. These are uh, leads which can pick up right ventricular activity and which will show us whether there is in right ventricular infarction. Certainly, there is, as you can see there, the significant elevation of uh, the ST segment in V4 or V5 R and V6 R. So this patient has inferior volume associated with right ventricular myocardial infarction. Now, anterolateral myocardial infarction, we said uh, obviously V1 to V6 anterolateral MI. Uh, here we have again 2, 3 AVF. Uh, 
ST elevation in 2, 3, if you can see, and you can also see the ST depression in the reciprocal 1 and AVL. Okay, can you look uh, very closely at this and tell me uh, the diagnosis? You can unmute and tell me the diagnosis. Can you tell me the diagnosis here? No answer, am I audible to you? Yes, sir. Hmm. So uh, very clearly you can see that it's inferior volume. I hope you understood that much, is it not so? Yes, there is ST segment elevation in uh, two, three and AVF. Now, when we discuss the theory part of uh, you know, uh, myocardial infarction and we discuss inferior volume, what, uh, what are the accompanying things you need to look out for in a patient with inferior volume? What did I tell you? Heart rate. Heart rate or more specifically, we have to look at the PR and double. Why should we look at the PR and double? Chance of junctional blocks. No, uh, not junctional, but uh, if you remember, we discussed that you know, inferior volume I is Conduct. due to occlusion, occlusion, yeah, conduction abnormalities. We, what conduction abnormalities? SA node and AV node. Yeah, essentially, most of the time, AV node is not so. So, because I said 90% of people, the AV node is supplied by the right coronary artery. Inferior volume I is due to occlusion of the right coronary artery. Therefore, it stands to reason that uh, in situations where you have an occlusion of uh, the inferior of the right coronary artery, you might have ischemia of the uh, AV node. And consequently, you expect uh, heart blocks or prolongations of the PR and double. You can see uh, very clearly if you look at this ECG, uh, look at the PR and double here, look at the PR and double here, there is no relationship between the P wave and the QRS complex. This PR is very short. Mm, this is so much, this is so long. So this patient is actually having a complete heart block, inferior volume with complete heart block. So that is another thing which you should be very carefully looking at in patients with inferior volume. You can see here how the PR and devil is prolonged here. So this one is uh, uh, short, this one is so long, this one is long. So there is no, as I said, there is no uh, definite relationship between the P wave and the QRS complex. So as I said, um, that is something you have to watch out for in inferior wall MI patients. In this patient, it seems that there is no progressive prolongation, etc. But we can see that the PR and double is prolonged and it's just a first degree heart block, which is accompanying the uh, first degree heart block, which as I said earlier, which we discussed earlier, is just a PR prolongation without any drop beats. So uh, the mildest form of AV nodal disease. Okay, I look at this ST elevation. In which leads does this patient have ST elevation? Look very carefully and tell me. Obviously, if you look at other things, you'll find it as normal. If you look at the P wave, the P wave looks normal. The PR and device is normal. The rate is uh, about 100 per minute. Uh, yeah, the QRS duration appears to be reasonably okay. Uh, the upper limit of normal 0.08 seconds. Uh, and uh, yeah, if, yes. So which, v1. where do you get V1 and, and V2? V2. Uh, Brugada. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. So this is not, uh, this is something which you should be very careful about. This is not myocardial infarction of the anterior wall. This is a phenomenon called as, or this disease called as Brugada syndrome. We saw this earlier. So uh, such a pattern of uh, ST elevation in V1 and V2 with a very mild widening of the QRS complex is suggestive of a Brugada syndrome. And this pattern you have to remember, it is not a classical coving. Uh, convexity which you see here but uh, you know only the initial portion is code then there's a rapid drop off this is uh, perhaps a very very characteristic uh, ecg pattern which you see over here so which you can see in v1 and v2 in most situations so that is the brugada syndrome we already discussed what brugada syndrome is as i said it is a mutation in a sodium channel which is uh, which is uh, uh, located on a particular type of sodium channel which is located on the right ventricular outflow tract there are repolarization abnormalities there and this predisposes to sudden cardiac death because of ventricular tachycardia. The best, best treatment because this is a channel of pathy and there's nothing uh, too much you can do about it. So placement of an implantable cardioverter defibrillator is the treatment of choice. So, so when you see this uh, sort of uh, ECG elevation, uh, sorry, ST elevation V1, V2, uh, you have to be very careful uh, to check whether it is actually a Brugada pattern. 
then talking about st segment depression we said if it were uh, st segment depression is rather non specific in the sense that you know uh, if you look at ecgs very with very fast rates etc you can have st segment depression so there can be three types of st segment depression one is a down sloping st segment depression another is up sloping and the third one is a horizontal okay now up sloping uh, st depressions really do not have uh, too much value at all so horizontal st segment depression has the most value followed by down sloping st segment depression we said when our discussion of ischemic heart disease that a horizontal st segment depression is usually suggestive of subendocardial ischemia uh, right so uh, as we as, as i told you in the previous slide you know, these are three major types of st depression up sloping uh, more than 1 mm uh, so high error rate in the sense that it is not likely to be uh, ischemia whereas horizontal uh, more than 1 mm st depression uh, from when we say more than 1 mm st depression we mean 1 mm from the baseline and the baseline we usually take the pr segment as the baseline pr segment so 1 mm compared to the pr segment uh, if it is if it is uh, uh, depressed if it is horizontal then that has a very low error rate in the sense that it is very accurate in predicting subendocardial ischemia whereas down sloping somewhere between up sloping and horizontal so not 5 to 10% error rate so not as much as up sloping so moral of the story up sloping st segment depressions are very common in ecgs especially ecgs with fast rate uh, when there is tachycardia and things like that therefore uh, too much attention need not be played to paid to those cases uh, if the patient has a clinical uh, symptom like excessive sweating hypotension classical retrocern chest pain etc then obviously it's a different matter and you'll go ahead with serial ecgs and investigations but otherwise uh, uh, in an asymptomatic patient uh, that does not have too much value so horizontal and down sloping st depressions are uh, are most important and these are the types of st depressions which are actually looked at uh, in a so called tmt test or a, or a treadmill or stress uh, exercise stress testing Uh, using the Bruce protocol, uh, and uh, so the sign of is uh, ischemia, which are looked at, is obviously an ST segment depression, whether it's horizontal or down sloping. So this uh, is a down sloping ST, or a particular pattern of down sloping ST depression, which we discussed even previously. Uh, <clears throat> if you look at the very tall R waves in V6, you will understand what it is. What is the cause for this? Hockey stick decoction. <clears throat> so this is the left one. Yeah. yeah that is uh, this is left ventricular hypertrophy obviously and uh, we discussed this pattern earlier and we said this is the so called strain pattern etc right strain pattern uh, so lvh with strain um, so uh, if the patient is having symptoms of chest pain etc you may go ahead and do troponin and take serial ecgs in this situation but it is very likely in such a case that this has been persisting for quite some time quite many months and if you look at the previous ecgs also it is going to show the same pattern a reciprocal st segment depression we already discussed for example this ecg shows you uh, st elevation in 2 3 uh, avf therefore it's an inferior wall myocardial infarction and consequently in the lateral walls you are going to have this horizontal you can see very clearly and here it is down sloping st depression which is uh, in the uh, opposite wall right so reciprocal st depressions next let's move to the last part of ventricular uh, repolarization which is the t wave or the late repolarization this t wave so uh, t waves can be uh, this is the normal t wave here the first one then we can have so called biphasic t waves where we have positivity with negativity you can have bifid of notched p waves uh, slow p waves these are all non specific abnormalities and are not of that much importance now specific t wave abnormalities we look at are the sharp pointy pointy peaked t waves of hyperkalemia uh, then ischemic heart disease having a very symmetric deep t wave inversion strain pattern we already saw the down sloping one and a very slow p wave a very slow peak and fall suggestive of a prolonged qt interval so these are some of the abnormal patterns which we have early repolarization variant we already mentioned earlier with early repolarization so these are uh, some of the abnormalities of t wave which you should be watching out for so hyperkalemia the deep symmetric t wave inversion of ischemic heart disease strain pattern prolonged intervals okay what is the ecg show what does this ecg show <clears throat> 
for TV. Yeah, it is uh, rather suggestive of a very tall and peak T wave. So when you say T wave, you always have to try to compare it with the height of the QRS complex, especially in the uh, lateral precordial leads. You can see here uh, the T waves are almost uh, taller, uh, or if not uh, as tall, if uh, then taller than V for the R wave and V five and V six. So this is uh, the classical tall tented T waves. tall and tented t waves of uh, hyperkalemia right tall and tented t waves of hyperkalemia so uh, let us move forward uh, you can see how tall they are especially in the lateral precordial leads v5 v6 now uh, these are uh, in general uh, um, uh, how uh, the, the ec changes progress in hyperkalemia according to serum potassium uh, now various sources differ now uh, one of the one of the best ecg sources you can have on the internet uh, is a website called as uh, life in the fast lane and when you get time or when you get doubt regarding any ecg abnormality uh, it this is an excellent resource uh, which you yourself can use life in the fast lane uh, its short form is litfl uh, com life in the fast lane so uh, some of the ecgs which i have shown here are taken from that site Uh, okay uh, so uh, so hyperkalemia it goes like this um, serum potassium more than 5 so we know the normal is between 3.5 to 5.5 now with more than 5.5 we start getting repolarization abnormalities when we say repolarization obviously see segment and t wave so the first problem is with the t wave we get peak t waves which is usually the first sign of hyperkalemia then when the potassium crosses 6.5 uh, you get abnormalities in the atria there is progressive paralysis of the atria which means that the p wave becomes slower and they become slower it means that they take more time when it be, takes more time it may it means that p wave becomes wide and then flatten and eventually it will disappear because of the atrial paralysis and the pr segment and the pr interval will lengthen pr segment will lengthen and the pr interval also will lengthen uh, later on so serum potassium more than 7 now you start getting conduction abnormalities and bradycardia there is Uh, a prolonged qrs duration because ventricular depolarization takes a lot of time that the qrs is prolonged uh, there is a high grade av block uh, the, uh, because the conduction across the ventricles across the av node is also very slow so you get av block and uh, the qrs becomes so wide that you get uh, what is called as a sine wave pattern uh, it looks like this sine wave pattern and if the serum potassium is above 9 usually there is cardiac arrest due to systole Uh, or ventricular fibrillation so this is this is the sequence of events which happen in hyperkalemia shall we move forward the previous slide once more ecg this is ecg i'll take it off the zoom so that you can appreciate clearly okay can you see it now the tall t waves especially lateral precordial leads Yes, sir. Yes, so, so you have to compare it with the R wave height, and you can see that it is taller than the R wave in most of those leads. V five, V four, V five, V six. It is taller than the R wave. Okay, so this is as we saw the sequence of events which occur. Now, different the, these values are absolutely not in you know, a hard and fast rule that this exactly happens at this potassium value, but this is the general trend uh, of what happens uh, in hyperkalemia in the heart. So we start off with tall tended T waves. there is a pr level prolongation and disappearance of the p wave widening of the qrs taking up of the st segment when i say taking up of the st segment see st segment uh, is like this normal t wave is like this when the t wave becomes very tall now what happens is the st segment slowly gets assimilated into the ascending limb of the t wave so that uh, in the end you will not be able to see a separate st segment at all the st segment is taken up into the ascending limb of the t wave and combined with the widening of the qrs now we get something like this so this is the t wave this is the wide qrs complex this is what we refer to as a sine wave pattern sine wave pattern and it's not very usual to see the sine wave pattern because this is a very sick patient and uh, the next thing which is going to happen in this patient this uh, as we mentioned earlier is systolic uh, so uh, it usually it's a very terminal uh, terminal change the patient is about to die very soon okay so uh, those are the classic you can see the so called sine wave sinusoidal pattern or sine wave pattern here uh, the uh, the uh, broad qrs complex and the big t wave combining to form give you the sine wave pattern 
So that is as far as the T wave is concerned. So we discussed the uh, QRS uh, complex, we discussed the SA segment, we discussed T wave. Now let's talk about the QT interval. The QT interval is defined as the time from the beginning of the Q wave, uh, beginning of the QRS complex to the end of the T wave. Beginning of the QRS complex to the end of the T wave. Therefore, it includes the QRS complex, ST segment and T wave, which means it includes the ventricular depolarization as well as ventricular repolarization. So the QT interval therefore uh, encompasses the entire electrical activity which happens in the ventricles. So that is the time taken for the ventricular electrical activity, both depolarization and repolarization. And uh, if there is a prolonged increase in the QT interval, with a normal looking QRS complex, normal narrow QRS complex, what does that tell us? The QRS complex is narrow and the uh, QT interval, when we estimate it is prolonged, it tells us that it is the, the problem is not during depolarization, the problem is during repolarization. And repolarization abnormalities in the ventricle are extremely dangerous because that can lead to so-called early after depolarizations etc., which can actually trigger different types of arrhythmia. So that is the QT interval. Let's have a look at it. The QT interval is from the beginning of the QRS complex to the end of the T wave. The normal QT interval is about 0.36 to 0.44 seconds. 0.36 to 0.44 seconds. And as you mentioned, it is the time taken for ventricular depolarization plus repolarization and QT prolongation is associated with the risk of ventricular arrhythmias. QT prolongation is associated with the risk of ventricular arrhythmias. So uh, QT prolongation can lead to early after depolarizations and uh, this can provoke TDP, Tosad Dapua, we already discussed this, uh, we did not discuss that. Um, we, we saw it briefly when we discussed ventricular tachyarrhythmias, the theory part we'll discuss during the theory class. Uh, okay, and this can also lead to ventricular fibrillation. So, so the QT interval is extremely important to measure in the ECG because it is a sort of marker uh, for uh, what happens in the ventricles. For correct interpretation, the QT interval should undergo adequate rate correction. And the corrected uh, QT is denoted by this particular term, QTC, QTC. So the QT, the most widely used formula for, for corrected QT is the measured QT interval divided by root of RR in seconds. Uh, root of the RR interval in seconds. QT interval divided by the root QT interval in seconds divided by the root of RR interval in seconds. RR interval obviously is the time between two adjacent uh, R waves. So that is the formula for this is not the only formula. There are other formulas called as you know, Framingham formula, Francisca formula, etc. But this is uh, the most widely used. Okay, so that is corrected QT interval, corrected QT interval. What are the causes of QT prolongation? You can have congenital syndromes. These are usually channelopathies which can affect uh, sodium or potassium channels so that uh, the, the, the deep uh, repolarization is prolonged. So congenital long QT syndromes, two syndromes which come to mind uh, straight away are uh, romano watt syndrome. romano watt syndrome and Jervell Lange Nielsen syndrome. Jervell Lange Nielsen syndrome. So these are two, you know, by no means are these the only two syndromes, but there are several more, but these are two commonly encountered uh, long QT syndromes, romano Watt syndrome and Jervell lange nielsen syndrome. Then, uh, very commonly uh, in the ward, you, this, you, this is seen due to either drugs or electrolytes. So usually due to some drugs which cause QT prolongation or electrolytes. By far, those are the two common causes. So electron abnormalities include hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia, hypokalemia. You mentioned earlier that hypercalcemia will produce a QRS shortening, so QT shortening. Uh, okay, uh, hypothermia, hypothyroidism, elderly, a dysautonomy, conditions like, for example, diabetes or uh, amyloidosis, etc. So those conditions can produce uh, uh, QT interval prolongation. CNS abnormalities can produce QT prolongation. Sub the three S's you had to remember here are subarachnoid hemorrhage, stroke, and seizures. Also uh, in head trauma, uh, 
uh, hydrocephalus, etc. You can get so subarachnoid hemorrhage, stroke, and seizure. Bradycardia. In general, even in normal persons, uh, when the heart rate decreases, the QT is prolonged. That is why we need to correct it because uh, that if your your heart rate might influence your decision what to do whether the QT is prolonged or not. Drugs. So as I told you, most commonly, uh, the cause of the acquired cause of QT prolongation are two. One is the electrolyte abnormalities like hypokalemia, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia. The other is drugs. There are a long list of drugs, but there is a pattern here. The most common ones uh, include first antidepressants and antipsychotics like tricyclic antidepressants, SSRI, etc. Uh, imipramine, uh, lithium, haloperidol. Antihistamines, especially older generation halo, uh, antihistamines. Uh, some of them have been actually taken off the market. For example, uh, terfenadine, terfenadine, astamisole, etc., which were uh, previously uh, they came into the market as so called non sedative antihistamines. Uh, uh, so, terfenadine uh, estimosol is not available in the market now. Loratidine is now available. Fexofenadine is now available. They are, uh, they are also claimed to be you know, non sedative, but uh, they also have mild uh, influence on the QT level, but not to the same degree as terfenadine or estimosol. Antimicrobials, the two major classes you have to look at are quinolones uh, and macrolide antibiotics. Quinolones. So, azithromycin, clarithromycin, uh, you have to be very careful, and quinolones like leofloxin, ciprofloxin. So those are things. Mm -hmm. Then the antifungals, fluconazole. The importance is that you know, these can be co-prescribed. For example, clarithromycin plus fluconazole plus azithromycin might be a very common co-prescription in somebody with HIV because a um, sorry, uh, uh, with ciprofloxin might be a co-prescription in somebody with HIV because clarithromycin is very commonly used for the treatment of uh, uh, mycobacterium avium complex fluconazole may be given as prophylaxis for candidiasis and ciproloxin may you may be giving for some bacterial pneumonia or urinary tract infection or whatever so uh, it is common so this, this such co-prescription should be uh, avoided as far as possible others chloroquine and also hydroxychloroquine of increasing interest to us now because of covid and uh, even though there is absolutely no evidence that uh, hydroxychloroquine does anything to the virus or to the outcome of patients uh, a lot of centers still use uh, hydroxychloroquine uh, in the treatment of COVID, um, and sometimes it is co-prescribed along with azithromycin or ciprofloxin. So that is that is going to produce problems as well as QT and cancer. cancer. Uh, Cisapride uh, and uh, uh, it has, it's con congener, mosapride. Uh, mosapride is a newer uh, member of that family. Both of them have been implicated. Cisapride is now taken off the market. Mosapride also, nobody uses it that much. It is still available. So cisapride and uh, its newer variant is available, levosulpiride, which does not have that much of an action on QT level, levosulpiride. We might have heard about all these things. So, so uh, that can also produce so, uh, chloroquine, cisapride, mosapride, levosulpiride, not to the same extent as cisapride, but still. So antibiotics, uh, antidepressants, antipsychotics, uh, the older generation antihistamines or non-sedative antihistamines. So these are some common drugs which can produce QT interval prolongation. Yes. Pericarditis. You might have noticed that this patient has something which we discussed earlier, an ST segment elevation with a convexity upwards like that. So we mentioned this uh, one differential diagnosis earlier, which was benign early repolarization. This is another one. This is another one, pericarditis. So ECG findings of pericarditis I'll be discussing. Uh, one of the classical things you have to remember is global ST elevation, global ST segment elevation which means that ST elevation is present in all leads, global ST segment elevation. Uh, please remember that pericardium is electrically inert. Okay, so the ECG findings you are getting here are actually not due to some deep, uh, repolarization abnormalities in the pericardium, but when there is inflammation in the pericardium, there is uh, some, this uh, inflammation also tends to involve the epicardium. So what we are what we are seeing in the ECG is actually the epicardial repolarization abnormality rather than the pericardial repolarization. 
uh, because pericardium obviously there is there is consists of fibrous tissue there is there's nothing to repolarize there in the pericardium okay so uh, so global st segment elevation which means that there is st segment elevation in all leads except for two leads avr and v1 okay so in avr and v1 there is st segment depression in all other leads there is st segment elevation another portion of the ecg which is affected is the pr segment uh, in the leads where you have st segment elevation we have pr segment depression so most leads you will get st segment elevation which we mentioned earlier is concave upwards then pr segment depression whereas in avr and v1 we get st segment depression and the opposite pr segment elevation and another important point to remember is that t inversion usually does not appear simultaneously with st segment elevation if you find t inversion t inversion appearing along with st segment elevation is more likely to be a myocardial infarction rather than the pericarditis even otherwise we can suspect that this is pericarditis because you know uh, for you for a person to have suddenly st segment elevation in 1 2 3 uh, then avl avf and then v1 to v6 Uh, several different vascular tertiary should be involved simultaneously which is uh, all those vessels should be occluded simultaneously which is not like which is not very unlikely uh, and therefore uh, using simple logic itself we can sometimes say that okay this is not the mi this is rather pericarditis another method you can use is as i said and the clue you, clue to the diagnosis might be the absence of t wave inversion in patients who are having st elevation in pericarditis you have st elevation but you don't have t wave inversion t wave inversion occur later only after the st segments have come down so that is another difference you have to know in pericarditis so it goes through these following stages stage 1 is diffuse st segment segment elevation in all leads except avr and v1 we call this global st segment elevation stage 2 in, in a couple of weeks or in, at the by the end of first week or middle of second week there is normalization then from third week onwards you can get t wave inversion and then it normalizes so as i said earlier the st segment elevation and t wave inversion does not coexist i hope i'm clear am i audible to you am i clear do you follow what i'm discussing here yes or no yes sir right okay next uh, uh, okay uh, we said uh, uh, a pr say look at avr for example here uh, avr uh, i said v avr and v1 there is st segment depression this is you can see that the st segment depressed and the pr segment is elevated ST segment is depressed, PR segment is elevated. Whereas all other leads, the ST segment is elevated and the PR segment is depressed. So that is uh, classical ECG finding of pericarditis. Yes, what is the diagnosis here? The arrow points to a wave. right it occurs after the t wave and this wave is called as the u wave this wave is called as the u wave now u wave may, may be normally seen uh, in some persons but uh, there are several causes the most common cause uh, obviously you might have heard about uh, is hypokalemia it's not so everybody associates u wave with hypokalemia there are other causes also so drugs uh, left ventricular hypertrophy hypertrophic cardiomyopathy hypoth so most of the conditions which produce a qt prolongation and we talk about these drugs also these are the same drugs which produce qt prolongation so those drugs which produce a pro qt interval prolongation and if you look at these conditions hypothermia hypocalcemia all these we are implicated uh, in our qt prolongation also so uh, all those causes of qt prolongation can also produce a u wave and the u wave uh, is usually uh, in the direction of the r wave it is in the same direction as the r wave upright u wave uh, the genesis of the u wave is un not understood clearly it is thought to be due to delayed repolarization of the purkinje fibers or even more distal parts like uh, mid myocardial so uh, myocardial fibers themselves m, m cells say called so delayed repolarization of purkinje fibers or the prolonged repolarization of mid myocardial m cells very prominent u waves indicate susceptibility for tdp that we know because very prominent u waves are produced by the same conditions which are producing a qt prolongation like hypokalemia these drugs uh, uh, hypertrophic ventricle uh, etc electrolyte abnormalities hypothermia so those also increase the risk for tdp naturally therefore presence of prominent u waves also indicates susceptibility for tdp one more feature to uh, tell you as i told you the u wave is usually in the same direction uh, it is upright 
uh, it is in the same direction as the r wave sometimes you can get an inverted u wave if you find inverted u wave in the presence of uh, a patient with chest pain it is very much suggestive of a coronary artery disease it is very much suggestive of ischemic heart disease inverted u wave in the presence of chest pain is very much suggestive of ischemic heart disease because most cases uh, in other situations like electrolyte abnormalities drugs etc the u wave is usually upright u wave is best appreciated uh, in v2 v3 so those are the two leads where uh, u wave is best appreciated so that uh, literally brings us to the end of uh, our session uh, so we have gone through uh, the ecg from uh, the initial basic portion to uh, starting from the sinus rhythm and how the placement of the ecg leads and the orientation uh, against uh, towards various wards etc we started with the endoven triangle we went on to discuss all the aspects uh, including the conducting system the p wave p r double the axis the torus complex and finally today we discuss the repolarization part so now uh, if you have any doubts you can either email me or you can call me or whatsapp me in this number i would request that you go back and revise uh, whatever i have taught you over the last two classes so that uh, when we uh, restart our discussion uh, of uh, ischemic heart disease heart failure arrhythmias etc you will have a better understanding of what we are talking about okay so good night everyone thanks for the patient listening good night sir